1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report for this evening, it goes back to our series on 1 Samuel, and we'll be talking about that. Just to give you some setup and, and let you know where we are, remember that Saul has just come back from fighting the Amalekites. He has disobeyed God. He has refused to do what God told him to do, which is to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites, leave nothing, don't, you know, destroy the livestock, destroy their possessions, their gold, their spoil, everything. You don't take anything with you. You basically burn it all. I want them wiped off the face of the earth. And part of that does sound just cruel and, and spiteful, but you have to remember part of the reason that God did this to, to those people in, in general is because he didn't want word going out that his people were, you know, sort of uh, pillaging other villages and that they were destroying it so that they could get gain. He specifically wanted them to destroy these societies that had been engaging in sinful acts like uh, destroying and, and killing children as sacrifices to their pagan gods and all these other things. He wanted them to be made an example of, and he wanted a message to be sent that this isn't about getting stuff for us. This is about them doing something that is wrong and us acting as God's arm to punish them for that. It's not about getting stuff. It's not about getting livestock. It's not about taking their gold and, and taking their king captive and all this stuff. All this is about is punishing them, and that's what God wanted. Saul didn't do that. Saul brought back the animals. He brought back the livestock, and he's already had this back and forth going with Samuel where he's denied it, said, no, no, I, I did what God told me to do. I I mean, I, I like mostly did what God told me to do, and I, I destroyed all the people. I just kept the choicest livestock, and, and really I only kept the choicest livestock so that I could offer sacrifice. That's why I kept the livestock around. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for the people around me. It was so we could offer sacrifice to your God, Samuel. You know, trying very, very hard to try to explain to Samuel why completely disobeying what God told him to do was justifiable and okay. Well, see, I'm, I'm doing it for God. I'm doing it so he can have sacrifices. And this is Samuel's response. And I, I find this one of the most profound verses in all the Bible because it tells us so much about God and his nature and how he views us. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 through 23, where he says, Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed the fat of rams, for rebellion is in the, as, excuse me, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. A couple big points to, to look at there. When he says, he, he makes the point, but I like how he starts out with a rhetorical question. And this is something that Jesus does much later. That we'll see often when a question is asked of Jesus, or there's some kind of spiritual teaching that needs to go on, that Jesus uses it as a teaching moment. He starts with a rhetorical question to get you thinking about why the answer is correct, not just tell you which answer is correct, which I think is very, very wise. Look at this first question. Has the Lord much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? See, that's something that gets you thinking. Because then instead of Saul doing his own thinking and, and doing what he would want if he were God, he puts himself in the position of God and then has to say, Huh, would I rather somebody obey me or offer me tribute? You see, God could have asked for the bulls and goats and the various animals of the Amalekites if he wanted to. If God wanted those offerings, he could have just taken them. He doesn't need the offerings. And Saul doing this, like, it's pretty clear that he wasn't doing it to sacrifice to God. 
but Samuel just kind of plays along with it. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into Saul's intent, but I don't think I am based on the context surrounding the story. But even assuming that he did have good intentions, even assuming that he really did want to sacrifice to God, and that's the reason he saved these animals, even if you assume that to be true, he's saying, okay, did you think that I would want that more than you obeying me? See, if, if God had really wanted Saul to do that, he would have told him to do it. There was a, and, and this is just kind of a side effect of me growing up with my father, who was an ag teacher, there would be things I had to do around the house that he'd ask me to do, and me being the very creative person that I am, um, sometimes I, I hid, hid behind the veil of that creativity and explaining why I didn't do something I was supposed to do. And something that my dad said to me and said to, you know, probably dozens if not hundreds of other kids throughout the years is he would say, son, if I wanted you to do it that way, don't you think I would have asked you to do it that way? And this is the same thing that's going on between Saul and God right now. Basically, that's what God is saying. He's saying, look, if I wanted the sacrifices, why wouldn't I have asked you for the sacrifices? What's more important here, and this is what Samuel is driving home to Saul, this is a teaching moment for him, is obedience. Your heart was not in the right place. You didn't have a desire to do what God asked you to do. You did what you wanted. And even if you try to hide it behind the veil of trying to do something nice for God, wouldn't it make more sense? Wouldn't God want obedience more than he would want tribute? For example, you know, we'll use the example of a, a parent and child. Would you rather... If you told your, your kid to go out and, and go into the gas station and, and buy something for me, would you rather them come out with what you ask for, or would you rather them come out with a, a candy bar for you because they know it's your favorite? Well, you know, there's some nice sentiment there, but frankly, I'd rather you just obey and, and do what I told you to do. If I'd wanted a candy bar, I'd have sent you in there for a candy bar. You see, God is in an all-knowing position. He is the Father. He knows that it's possible that Saul could have gone to the Amalekites, destroyed everything but the livestock, and brought it back. But that's not what he asked for. And the fact that he brings back the king as well, that pretty much shows where Saul's heart really is. Because there's no way that you could even come up with a religious excuse for wanting to bring the king back and disobeying God. And because of that, Saul now finds himself in this position and the explanation that Samuel gives to him in verse 23 is that rebellion is the same thing as the sin of divination. Now, why? Why is it that he brings that up? Why divination? That just seems like such an obscure sin. It's because that was the sin that Saul didn't like. You see, all Christians and, and all people that follow God we have certain sins that we see as, as double super bad sins. Now, a mature and learned Christian will sort of work that out of his system the more that he walks with God, at least to some degree, but it's always going to be there. There's always one sin that just triggers our disgust factor for whatever reason. A lot of people have complained over the years that, they, that a lot of Christians are particularly disgusted and, and particularly they have a stronger dislike for things like homosexuality than they do other sins. And that's, you know, not an altogether uh, completely irrational criticism there. Because there are some Christians that treat that like it's the worst thing that you can do, and that's not correct, because there are tons of sexual sins out there that are just as bad. And that doesn't mean that homosexuality is not bad, it just means that uh, there it, it makes sense to hold the same standard for everything that is a sin. And that's what Samuel is conveying to Saul right now. He's saying... Yeah, divination, your pet sin that you, uh, or not pet sin, that would be the one that he likes to do, uh, the sin that you have driven all of the diviners, all those with familiar spirits, all the witches out, and, and we'll actually see later in this same book that Saul was the one responsible for that. He was so averse to, he hated the sin of divination so much that one of the things that he did as king is he made sure that was not in his kingdom. 
when all throughout the kingdom made sure, nope, no diviners, no witches, no people with, with familiar spirits, that's going to be the sin that I persecute the most because I think it's the worst one. It's just the one that bothers me the most. And so I'm going to make sure that is not in the kingdom of Israel. And then God says, yeah, your disobedience, that was just as sinful, and that hurts me just as much as you doing what you just did. That's why that's the first sin that he mentions. And I think that's a powerful message for each one of us, too. That whenever we're disobedient to God, even if it's something that we in our own head kind of think of as a little sin, to God, it's just as bad as the absolute worst sin that we, we think of. Even worse, actually, because He is a holy God and we're a flawed human being. So, if you just do happen to be one of those people that think of the, the worst sin that you can do, for a lot of Christians, it's abortion, and that's the one that it is for me. That me lying to my brother or sister, or me just, you know, not being concerned for them. Because remember, not being obedient here was a sin of omission, not a sin of commission. And so this is Saul just not doing what God told him to do. So if it's something for us like not being kind, or not living the way Christ would have, or not preaching the gospel to people, to God, that's the same as the sin of abortion, or murder, or theft, or pedophilia. Now, that sounds harsh, and that's because it is. That's the message that Samuel is trying to drive home here. He's saying, with all your disgust, with all your disdain, for that one sin that you look at and you just, yeah, I mean, it, it makes your eyes go red and you just can't stand it, that's what your disobedience feels like to me. Saul has hurt God by disobe disobeying his word. And Samuel's trying to convey that to Saul so that he can understand what he has done. Hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll never find ourselves in that position because you'll read in that same verse that because of that, he's saying, and God has rejected you as king. Now granted, Saul has made mistakes before. Saul has not been a perfect king up until this point. In fact, he's already warned him that the kingdom is going to be taken away from him at some point. That, that has happened before this episode transpired. But he's saying that because of this, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, you are no longer fit to be my king. You are not fit to lead my people. It's a bad position to be in, and it's one that we have to understand that if we are in open rebellion to God, if we refuse to do the things that He asks of us, that's the same position that we're going to find ourselves in. It's not because God wasn't patient with Saul, didn't give him multiple opportunities to correct his ways, but He saw in, in Saul a heart that does not have a desire to do what God tells him to do. And for that... He's not somebody that is fit to lead other people because remember that the purpose of a king, the purpose of a leader, the purpose of anyone in a leadership position in God's kingdom is ultimately to show other people how to obey God. And Saul can't do that anymore because he himself isn't doing it. So if we as Christians in the modern sense living with our, our families and neighbors, if we're not obeying God, if we don't have that heart to do what God asks us to do, then we're not fit to lead other people to Christ. And so we've got to get this right, or else our purpose, our calling, we will be rejected from that as well, just like Saul was rejected from the throne. Stay the course, friends. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't, this is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.